Hi, I'm Joe Marola. I'm going to be discussing management strategies for psoriatic arthritis, enhancing recognition and implementing treat to target guidelines. So again, I'm uh, Joe Marola. I'm a dermatologist and rheumatologist uh, here in Boston at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, and I run uh, the Center for Skin and Related Musculoskeletal Diseases. These are my disclosures. And these are our learning objectives. And we're gonna focus on a few different areas um, starting with a little bit of uh, level setting around the disease state and then talking about uh, current treatments and how treat to target uh, hopefully gets our patients to uh, the best uh, place for their both skin and joint disease. So I'm gonna start with a case. Um, and <clears throat> this is more to frame where we're headed and to think about uh, some of the challenges that may um, you know, face us in the clinic when dealing with a patient with psoriatic disease. So this is a 45 year old woman with psoriasis. She was diagnosed with psoriasis at age 25, referred to a rheumatologist just two years ago for concern of psoriatic arthritis. Uh, at that time was prescribed adalimumab uh, at the standard dose. Um, she also has poorly controlled diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, was hospitalized twice in the past three years for cellulitis and is on uh, some of the medications you see listed there. Um, I'll pause just to say, I, I think many know, but um, our patients with psoriatic disease certainly have a number of uh, comorbidities or potential comorbidities that come associated with psoriatic uh, disease. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, on physical exam uh, of her skin, there's a, uh, there are well demarcated erythematous scaly plaques on the trunk, scalp and extremities involving at least 20% body surface area. So quite severe disease. Also nail changes are present. Um, uh, <clears throat> the patient was noted to have dactylitis or sausage digit um, pain in the heels as well as in the back. And again, unpacking that a bit as we will, probably uh, inferring some enthesitis as well as potential axial or inflammatory back uh, uh, component to her disease. She does complain about joint pain as well as skin symptoms, uh, itching and burning. And she has a family history notable for a mother with multiple sclerosis, father with a history of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So her vital signs were normal. Uh, her physical exam is very much as billed, about 20% body surface area with nail and peripheral joint involvement, the dactylitis, as well as suggestion on exam of potential axial involvement, as well as enthesitis. Um, X-rays were important because they did suggest uh, erosive disease. And we'll talk about that as it might relate to uh, treatment choices, but also to a more aggressive uh, phenotype of disease, potentially leading to more damage. Um, pelvic x-ray also did confirm sacroiliac uh, sclerotic changes that are consistent with sacroiliitis. Um, you can see some of the values for the patient's uh, reported um, um, uh, activity or severity here. Um, and uh, laboratory findings um, suggest uh, slight elevated uh, transaminases that might suggest, for example, fatty liver in the context of the diabetes um, and, uh, uh, and metabolic syndrome. Uh, and some elevated inflammatory markers, which might also cluster, for example, with uh, the more erosive uh, damaging phenotype. <clears throat> so let's just spend a brief level setting moment on pathogenesis of psoriatic disease, and then we'll talk and really focus a lot of our attention on treatment um, <clears throat> uh, strategies. So in terms of the pathogenesis of psoriatic arthritis, I'd like to share this slide. It's a really nice figure from the New England Journal, Chris Richland and colleagues. Um, uh, reminding us that uh, there are several features of disease. Now, not shown here is the genetic uh, predisposition uh, for both psoriasis as well as psoriatic arthritis uh, and some area of overlap between those, um, in addition to some environmental uh, triggers that are less well uh, understood. We can see the uh, potential impact of uh, microbial dysbiosis in the gut. Um, and you know, I, I like to show this slide because it reminds particularly my dermatology colleagues that so many of the same players that we're used to seeing in the um, skin psoriatic pathogenesis slides are present here as well in the joint. Um, so TNF, IL-23, uh, IL-17, um, all sort of key cytokines in the pathogenesis. Um, here, instead of having impact, for example, on the keratinocyte leading to uh, proliferation and, and the psoriatic plaque, Instead, we see impact on uh, the bone uh, and really at that uh, synovial and thesial um, complex, uh, ultimately leading to potentially bone erosion, new bone formation, uh, uniquely to psoriatic arthritis uh, uh, and uh, uh, the potential for anthesial uh, disease itself. So again, just reminding us that a lot of the same players 
uh, that we are familiar with in the skin here also uh, playing a role in, uh, in the joint. <clears throat> And uh, let's also look for a moment at the burden of psoriatic arthritis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, psoriatic disease with regard to symptoms and comorbidities. So I think this is an important slide just to remind us that really in order to optimize patients' quality of life, we need to optimize both the skin and the joints. Um, that's shown here by, um, you can see the EQ5D um, in uh, shading. So essentially the idealized patient is in the red zone. Um, and we can see that optimizing both skin, as noted by the PASI, as well as DAPSA, uh, which uh, really encompasses a number of uh, psoriatic arthritis domains, uh, is how we maximize uh, and successfully treat our patients. So just to remind us that both skin and joints matter to patients, and really we want to optimally treat both. <clears throat> and the list of comorbidities or co-prevalent diseases um, really is, is long. Uh, we don't have enough time to go into great detail uh, but to say again, um, you know, there's a high co-prevalence of metabolic syndrome, uh, diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, uh, increased risk for um, uh, cardiac events uh, such as MI, uh, increased uh, risk of gout, particularly among PSA patients, um, anxiety, depression, uh, among other um, comorbidities that really makes this, um, uh, you know, a, a more difficult to treat entity for a variety of reasons, including this, which is that uh, in addition to finding the right treatment based on the flavor of disease, if you will, the phenotype uh, or domain of disease that a particular patient has, we also have to layer the considerations for other comorbidities um, with regard to um, <clears throat> uh, uh, treatment op uh, options, right? So for example, uh, we can see that not all treatments necessarily are compatible with a given comorbidity, or, um, for example, uh, liver disease and methotrexate. Um, or perhaps um, IBD, um, active IBD, and anti-IL-17 use. <clears throat> and ultimately, how do we deal with this complexity? And I think you know the the, the quick answer is um, I, I don't think any one specialty is necessarily charged with the entire treatment of uh, the psoriatic patient, but instead it takes a team. Uh, and so you know whether it's a, as a dermatologist or a rheumatologist or other provider, it's really um, you know, thinking about uh, owning the piece that we uh, own best and are, are comfortable with treating to target, um, screening for those comorbidities, and then dealing with some of the referral and education, um, you know, at the comfort level uh, of the provider. And I think at the minimum, helping a patient get to the right, uh, you know, team uh, of uh, providers really is how we most uh, ideally optimize um, disease. And we'll talk about that uh, a little further. <clears throat> So with regard to diagnosis and classification, um, there are some uh, challenges and potential consequences of not getting a patient to the right diagnosis in a timely manner. And so you know, what are some of the challenges of getting patients to um, the proper diagnosis, particularly having the psoriasis patient appropriately diagnosed uh, with psoriatic arthritis? So one of the challenges is the heterogeneity of disease, the fact that uh, a patient may present with very different findings from another, uh, one being predominantly soft tissue enthesitis, another uh, potentially with axial involvement, for example. Um, it, the disease does remain still a clinical diagnosis, so we don't, of course, have a diagnostic test for psoriatic arthritis. Um, there remains some amount of limited awareness of psoriatic arthritis, particularly among non-rheumatologists. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we identify some of the most at-risk groups for developing psoriatic arthritis among psoriasis patients. And then with regard to treatment options, um, you know, we don't really have a personalized medicine predictive approach to which treatment uh, will be the right one for a given patient. And so you know, we'll, we rely on some of the guidelines, the data available to us, and then still some trial and error with regard to um, how well a patient does on a given therapy. <clears throat> so again, with regard to heterogeneity, um, these are um, this is one of the really, I think, helpful frameworks for thinking about how to approach psoriatic disease, and that's these GRAPA domain-based approach uh, to psoriatic disease. Um, and these six different domains, I think, help us frame our therapeutic approach. So peripheral arthritis, axial disease, enthesitis, dactylitis, skin disease, and nail disease. And so, you know, as dermatologists, or at least as the non-rheumatologist, we also know that we're probably missing a reasonable amount of our psoriatic arthritis patients. Um, this study, which is frequently quoted, showed that upwards of 41% of patients with psoriasis 
um, had an undiagnosed psoriatic arthritis diagnosis um, in being screened by a rheumatologist. And so we're probably missing a lot of patients with psoriatic arthritis. Um, and, and we really are charged uh, with the screening process, which we'll talk about. And why is it important? Uh, it's important because a delay in diagnosis as brief as six months has been shown to be associated with increased erosion, uh, joint damage, joint deformity, and functional disability. And so getting patients to the right therapy and the right treatment um, ultimately uh, is important for preventing uh, damage. <clears throat> now, with regard to psoriasis patients that are at elevated risk for psoriatic arthritis, there are a number of phenotypes that should um, raise uh, suspicion. Now, again, all psoriasis patients are potentially at risk uh, and should be screened. But in addition to that, we know that scalp disease, inverse psoriasis or intertriginous disease in body fold areas, nail psoriasis, um, all contribute to uh, an, an increased risk seemingly for the development of psoriatic arthritis. Having a first degree relative of psoriatic arthritis has been shown as a strong risk factor for, the, uh, for predicting uh, psoriatic arthritis in an individual. Severity of psoriasis may as well, um, as well as some other uh, features uh, that are less, um, particularly less uh, clinically available right now, such as serum biomarkers uh, for which there is ongoing work. <clears throat> Um, this is one of the easier tools, I think, for thinking about asking our patients uh, uh, if they might have psoriatic arthritis. And this is the PSA um, mnemonic. So asking all patients about joint pain, P for pain, S for stiffness, particularly after a period of inactivity, or if you can remember a second S, the swelling or sausage digit, which is quite specific for um, spondyloarthritis and psoriatic arthritis, and A for axial disease or spinal involvement. There are a variety of validated screening tools, such as the PEST tool, uh, which is a simple five question tool that can be given to a patient in the waiting room before a visit or at another time. Um, if they score three out of five, um, they should be referred uh, or be at least be considered for um, uh, appropriate screening for psoriatic arthritis. And increasingly, I think we, we may see a role for ultrasound in the screening and diagnosis. Again, this is, we don't have time to go into great detail, but it's even possible um, we could envision a time in the future where perhaps the non-rheumatologist, non-radiologist uh, may also um, incorporate imaging into their uh, diagnostic and screening algorithms. Uh, another tool that's worth knowing about is the PSED. So this is a validated psoriatic arthritis symptom questionnaire. And uh, it's been shown that a, <clears throat> um, a cutoff score of um, four uh, uh, represents a, a symptom acceptable state, uh, whereas above um, four suggests that the patient is not in good control with regard to their psoriatic arthritis. Um, I raise this because the, it is actually possible for patients to on their own complete the PEST screening tool, and if positive, consider uh, completing the PSED. Um, the Grappa app, for example, has all of these available, and they have been translated into a large number of uh, languages internationally. Um, this is freely available for download um, at the uh, App Store and something that could be used uh, in a waiting room or, you know, for, uh, a patient could be directed to this, um, you know, uh, even before or after a visit. <clears throat> and I raise that because um, this framework has been suggested by the uh, Idiom Group, where a psoriasis patient is essentially screened using a PEST tool and ultimately given a PSED to help um, with decision-making around whether or not to refer for to a rheumatologist, for example, or even if they're on therapy to consider whether or not they're in a symptom acceptable state using that PSED, again, to either keep them on therapy or to consider whether modification therapy would get them to a better place uh, and, and ultimately uh, you know, may lead to co-management or referral as appropriate. So we reached the treatment uh, portion, um, all of that said, and I'm gonna focus very, very briefly on sort of uh, you know, current uh, and first line therapies and think about where emerging therapies might fit um, you know, in, the, in the coming years. And uh, I am gonna have a bit of a PSA focus here, but I'll, I'll touch on uh, skin where appropriate. And so when we look at the treatment options in 2021, uh, it can at first be a bit overwhelming. Um, we have a lot of options and the question is, well, how do we begin to pick these apart? How do we find the right treatment for the right patient? And as I said at the beginning, I think the two layers uh, to begin with that we mentioned are one, uh, the domain-based approach. So which 
um, domains of disease, what flavor of disease does our patient have? Um, that may help us decide uh, among agents where not all agents uh, behave equally in all domains. Similarly, we may consider um, uh, comorbidities in terms of compatibility with a the therapy or the potential that we may uh, kill two birds with one stone, uh, if you will, uh, in terms of picking a therapy that might face uh, more one aspect of uh, comorbid disease. And so these are the treatments at our fingertips. And so again, you know, one schematic is to look at that first layer of uh, domain-based approach, and I won't go into this in great detail. <clears throat> But I did make this table, which I think uh, might be helpful. And please take this with a grain of salt as well. There's nothing hard and fast here. Uh, for the most part, what you see is um, uh, largely my assessment of uh, FDA approved uh, indications and data where we have it available across these different domains for the variety of mechanisms you see on the far left. And then uh, we're available both head to head and real world uh, experience and uh, real world evidence to support you know, sort of variable efficacy in different domains. Um, I really will you know, start by saying um, <clears throat> there is uh, a, a paucity of data around methotrexate in psoriatic arthritis. I'll share a comment with you about that briefly in a moment, but particularly for peripheral arthritis, certainly used more historically for skin and nail disease, you know, with modest efficacy uh, in that compartment. Important to know that many of our um, uh, older um, DMARDs uh, do not treat axial disease. Uh, so methotrexate, for example, does not treat axial involvement. That's very important. And again, a paucity of data around dactylitis enthesitis where it probably uh, is not terribly robust. Um, <clears throat> a premolast oral small molecule uh, approved for psoriatic arthritis, peripheral disease, as well as skin disease. They have shown data to support uh, benefit in dactylitis enthesitis. They do not uh, have radiographic progression uh, data and, uh, and, um, and ac or, or axial uh, data. Uh, with regard to anti-TNF uh, therapy, um, very high level, you can see really that it sort of covers the breadth of domains of disease, including peripheral arthritis, as well as skin and nail disease, um, axial disease, where there's an approval in ankylosing spondylitis from which we extrapolate uh, efficacy in um, axial psoriatic arthritis improvement in dactylitis, enthesitis. And if a patient has comorbid IBD, uh, of which two to 5% or so are quoted to have psoriatic overlap with IBD, um, this would be quite compatible and indicated for uh, that condition. IL-1223, you know, more modest uh, peripheral arthritis efficacy data, um, good uh, skin and nail data, um, um, failed trial in axial disease. So not an option for axial disease, but data for dactylitis enthesitis and an approval at a different dose for IBD. Um, for uh, P19 inhibitors, our, some of our newer agents, um, we see uh, now one of the first P19 inhibitors, Guselcumab, uh, had a recent approval on psoriatic arthritis. I'll share that data with you. Um, excellent skin and uh, nail data. Um, unclear whether or not axial disease will be covered by this class. I'll mention that briefly in a moment. Dactylitis and enthesitis data is uh, present in ongoing studies uh, in IBD, which look very promising. IL-17 inhibitors, very robust um, with regard to both arthritis and skin and nail data, which I will show you. Um, approvals in axial disease, and actually even uh, secukinumab has a dedicated study in axial spondyloarthritis, or axial psoriatic arthritis, I should say, um, that has shown a benefit. And so, um, you know, very robust data in the axial compartment as well as dactylitis, enthesitis. However, a contraindication with active IBD uh, in this class. So that's uh, something to be aware of. And then with regard to JAK inhibitors, uh, we don't have time to go into great detail here, but approval of tofacitinib in psoriatic arthritis. Um, uh, we will talk about some of the newest data for upadacitinib that's very exciting in psoriatic arthritis, um, as well as, um, uh, both one approval for um, axial disease that I'll mention, some ongoing studies, and then data for dactylitis enthesitis and ulcerative colitis, um, not Crohn's disease with uh, tofacitinib um, at a higher dose. <clears throat> so all that said, um, I won't uh, go into any great detail here, but methotrexate has a bit of a mixed history uh, and there is a paucity of data with regard to how well methotrexate works in psoriatic arthritis. We had on the one hand, the um, you know, failed MIPA trial. Uh, on the other hand, we've had 
several looks at um, methotrexate in the context of combination and other studies that in fact um, do suggest benefit. Uh, if you're interested in a little summary comment about this, uh, myself and my uh, friend and colleague Alexis Ogby uh, wrote uh, a little commentary summarizing some of that data. <clears throat> and I don't have time for uh, older therapy level setting, but I will say that anti-TNFs have very much been a mainstay of therapy. If you look at the ACR guidelines, in fact, um, this class uh, was initially recommended over some other oral small molecules such as methotrexate as a first-line agent. Um, and in many respects, you know, has been um, a go-to for and first-line agent for psoriasis sure, for so many years. Um, you know, and I hate to boil it down to uh, oversimplifying the, the so-called 60-40-20 rule here, but um, just for reference, as we look through some of the newer therapies and how they might stack up, um, we've come to know the ACR 20, 50, and 70 responses to be roughly 60, 40, 20 percent across some of the pivotal trials uh, for these agents. And again, I can't go into great uh, detail, uh, but you can see and compare some of the pivotal uh, trials uh, with uh, anti-TNFs in psoriatic arthritis um, and, uh, you know, and, and would understand, if, of course, why these have been um, really a mainstay of therapy, more modest PASI 75 numbers than what we've come to know from some of the newer mechanisms of action uh, in psoriatic skin disease. <clears throat> so with regard to head-to-head -head data, um, using that sort of benchmark of an anti-TNF, uh, you know, we are lucky in dermatology to have a lot of head-to-head -head data um, of some of our newer agents against a variety of different mechanisms, whether it's IL-1223, anti-TNF or others. Um, we have much less of that in psoriatic arthritis, but I will share with you what we do have, as I think it's important in decision making. And so, one important recent study was the Spirit Head to Head study, which looked at ixekizumab versus adalimumab. Um, you can see here that the outcome, and this is very important, was a composite of ACR50 and PASI100. So, a very stringent skin endpoint, as well as a very stringent psoriatic arthritis endpoint. Um, and one had to meet both of those, right? This is a comp combined endpoint. So you'll see here in their study, they showed um, a, a, a superior um, performance of ixekizumab over adalimumab at the week 24 time point and out to week 52 with regard to this composite endpoint. When you unpack that a little bit further, um, you know, uh, and look just at the joint data with the ACR uh, 205070 data, I think you can see that these are more overlapping. And I, I, I think it's fair to say that they are really behaving um, similarly, with regard to joint efficacy, which is, you know, very impressive, uh, of course, um, but also that probably that superiority piece is also driven by the fact that um, we know that excusumab is a very robust skin um, uh, treatment with regard to psoriasis. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other thing that I think increasingly we're hearing about, and I wanted to show briefly, are some of these other composite endpoints that really are um, very much psoriatic disease facing. So for example, the MDA, minimal disease activity, very low disease activity. These are composites that include multiple different domains of disease. And you can see here, uh, importantly, that ixekizumab uh, is, um, uh, is performing very well compared even with adalimumab uh, with regard to this very stringent endpoint of minimal disease activity, which is considered a low disease activity state or even remittive state. Um, and so I, I think, you know, again, speaking to the IL-17 class and ixekizumab here specifically uh, being very robust to our psoriatic arthritis disease. Again, very similarly uh, impressive uh, uh, efficacy uh, in this head-to-head -head study with regard to enthesitis, and this is resolution of enthesitis, dactylitis uh, as well, and even nail disease. So you know, just to juxtapose a little bit, um, our workhorse of anti-TNF in this space with what we have come to see with uh, IL-17. Similarly, we have another study of secukinumab versus adalimumab in the EXCEED trial. Um, this was, again, uh, you know, a, um, uh, a, uh, an important sort of head-to-head -head look at the data. You'll see numerically, I think, um, that these are very, very similar with regard to secukinumab, adalimumab performance over time. In fact, um, the primary endpoint um, was not met in this study um, uh, by statistical significance, which I'll show you in a moment. But again, numerically, I think you get a sense that these are behaving very similarly. 
Um, and this was again with uh, regard to an a, um, ACR20 endpoint. Um, and that's shown at the top level here. So you can see 67% versus 62%, uh, not st statistically significant. Um, if you pick apart that data a bit further, looking at um, <clears throat> an NRI analysis of the data, in fact, you do see a statistical significant difference, although that was not um, the primary endpoint um, as uh, specified. And um, if you compare this ACR50 PASI 100 composite, similar to what we saw with ixekizumab in the um, uh, spirit head-to-head -head study, in fact, you do see a statistically significant difference here. Um, uh, and you know, again, probably at least in part uh, with skin-driven responses as we saw with spirit head-to-head. -head. <clears throat> so what's emerging and on the, on the horizon with regard to IL-17s? Um, bimekizumab is a very exciting um, anti-IL-17 AF inhibitor. Um, you know, we haven't yet seen uh, and wait with bated breath their phase three uh, results uh, with regard to psoriatic arthritis. We have seen phase three skin results that look incredibly uh, impressive, uh, which I am not sharing here, but I am sharing their phase two psoriatic arthritis data, which has shown some of the highest ACR uh, 20 and 50 response rates um, you can see here the ACR50 of what we have come to see for ACR20 results in some other uh, agents. And so, you know, very hopeful that this may move the bar a bit for our patients, but not yet approved. And we haven't seen the phase three yet. So stay tuned for that one. Um, this is the maximized trial I mentioned earlier, again, with regard to IL-17 axial disease. This was a study that reminded us in fact, that um, axial PSA may behave similarly to um, ankylosing spondylitis and axial spondyloarthritis um, it, when treated with IL-17 inhibition. Uh, and again, you can see that here with the ACES-20 result in this axial psoriatic arthritis population. <clears throat> so what about those P19 inhibitors I mentioned earlier? So, you know, um, something that we as dermatologists for the last few years have had in our uh, in our arsenal, incredibly robust uh, and impressive uh, skin uh, treatment uh, results uh, in our patients um, that really has moved the bar for skin psoriasis. Um, but how does it behave with, uh, with regard to psoriatic arthritis? And so, um, you know, um, Guselkimab specifically now FDA approved for psoriatic arthritis. You can see here their ACR 205070 results from the DISCOVER 1 uh, and 2 trials. Um, you can also see uh, improvement here in uh, enthesitis with enthesitis resolution uh, at week 24. Um, I think highly relevant as an endpoint, uh, in particular, for example, to dermatologists where uh, I believe enthesitis is you know, one of the more common uh, manifestations that we may see presenting to the dermatology office. Um, and we also see that very stringent MDA composite result here um, of upwards of you know, 30% at the Q4 week and 23% at the Q8 week dose uh, at week 24. And in fact, we don't have time to go into more detail here, um, but if we follow some of those data out, even to week 52, we see um, even further improvement and sustained uh, uh, results out to week 52. That's uh, very encouraging. And I think gives us yet another um, uh, uh, you know, um, weapon in our arsenal for treating our psoriasis or arthritis patients. <clears throat> and one point of interest here, I mentioned on uh, that summary slide earlier that um, uh, Eustachinumab was actually shown not to be effective in axial spondyloarthritis. Um, and there was also a, uh, a failed risenkizumab trial at some point in ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, however, what, what's been interesting is after um, this class of agents was sort of discounted um, from uh, you know, thinking about uh, spinal uh, benefit, in fact, uh, the guselkimab program included patients who had um, uh, uh, evidence of axial um, uh, involvement of their psoriatic disease. Uh, and uh, in fact, in a um, uh, analysis of those patients showed what seems to be improvement in um, spinal symptoms um, at week 24 that are you know, pr pretty, uh, pretty intriguing. And so I think this question of, in fact, will we see efficacy in the spinal compartment from these P19 inhibitors has been sort of resurrected. Uh, and I think we you know, wait to see more data uh, on this front. <clears throat> um, also excitingly, um, risenkizumab, again, something we've had in dermatology for a while now um, in, in terms of a high efficacy skin drug um, has uh, wrapped up their phase three trials for psoriatic arthritis. Some of the high level data um, has been shared, although we have not yet seen the nuanced uh, data uh, from phase three. 
uh, but you can get a sense here of the ACR 205070 data from Keepsake 1 and Keepsake 2 um, with uh, placebo rates sort of similar to what we uh, saw in the guselkumab discover trials. So again, looking uh, very promising uh, for psoriatic arthritis as well. Um, some of the endpoints, including um, those for radiographic progression inhibition were not met uh, in this study. Uh, but again, we, are, we await um, more data to be able to you know, really have a better look at this. But again, very, very promising for our patients with both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in particular. So what about JAK inhibitors? There is a plethora of JAK inhibitors available or coming, uh, many of which uh, are selective uh, inhibitors of various uh, JAK uh, heterodimer pairs, um, as you can see here. Um, I will focus our attention for a moment on tofacitinib, which is approved for psoriatic arthritis. You can see some of the ACR 205070 data here from their pivotal trials, um, 50 and 60% ACR20, uh, depending on the dose um, compared with placebo. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I use that as a jumping point to mention emerging therapeutics, in particular, upadacitinib, which has, um, I think, you know, very uh, exciting data with regard to psoriatic arthritis in the select PSA program. Um, one really important, I think, anchor here for us is that there was an active arm of adalimumab in this study. Uh, and I think the reason that's so helpful is, again, in using that as an anchor, um, I think clinically and as well as in this, you know, in the context of this trial, um, you can get a sense of how well um, this drug performed with regard to ACR20 uh, and ACR50 as early as week uh, 12. Um, and so I think that's, you know, incredibly encouraging, again, for our patients to have another um, uh, potential option that's an oral option for psoriatic arthritis. Um, what's also intriguing is actually very robust skin data. You can see the PASI 75 as soon as week 16 here was almost uh, that of, uh, of uh, adalimumab. Um, so, you know, I think also important when we think about how that domain of disease might be treated over time um, uh, in our psoriatic uh, patients. Uh, and similarly, I mentioned earlier, these stringent composites like MDA, uh, again, you know, very um, impressive numbers for minimal disease activity at week 24, um, that of a biologic uh, in many respects. Um, and then uh, similarly with enthesitis and dactylitis resolution. So very, very promising data. I think, you know, um, one of the on balance uh, questions, of course, among any of these JAK inhibitors, including the selective JAKs will be about safety, uh, particularly in our patients with comorbidities like metabolic syndrome, obesity, uh, and those already at risk for heart disease you know, or questions that have been raised around VTE, MACE, uh, and other potential side effects uh, on balance. <clears throat> and then this again is, um, you know, uh, tofacitinib has already uh, gained an approval for ankylosing spondylitis, axial, you know, sp uh, spondylitis. And here uh, we have some data suggesting as well that um, in fact, uh, upadacitinib um, may have impact in the spine uh, but there you know, certainly more to come. This is not yet approved for that indication. And so <clears throat> to wrap up our discussion, we've talked a lot about treatments and background. I think, um, you know, how do we really improve outcomes for our patients? So we mentioned already that increasingly we're discussing, you know, more aspirational endpoints of remission. And there are even some groups, the National Psoriasis Foundation, among others, who have started to talk about, well, will we get to a cure? Uh, at some point since we've been able to push the envelope so far, particularly in the skin, uh, you know, uh, component of disease, but also uh, in with regard to psoriatic arthritis. Um, I think the TACOPA study, the tight control of psoriatic arthritis study, showed us that um, using a treat to target um, goal, such as minimal disease activity, uh, does in fact improve outcomes. Uh, and I think, you know, that really is one of the basis, uh, bases for our discussion about um, how to approach uh, you know, a treat-to-target strategy for psoriatic arthritis. Um, these are those data showing tight control um, uh, had better um, outcomes for patients. <clears throat> it's also led to some of the treatment target algorithms that are available out there. Again, in the interest of time, I can't go into detail except to say these are available and I'd encourage you to, you know, look through these and, and, and uh, think a little bit more about how they may impact your practice. Um, but uh, you can see that some of the targets, again, are using endpoints such as uh, DAPSA and MDA, minimal disease activity, to drive therapeutic decision-making. This is the MDA, um, uh, these are the MDA components. Um, again, in the interest of time, um, I'll just say that if you're 
in clinic, if you're already collecting, for example, a rapid three and you do a joint assessment and ask about the skin, you've essentially done all of the components of a minimal disease activity. Uh, so keep that in mind as it is more feasible than it might appear uh, on this slide. And, and that really is summarized here where you know the only piece is really missing if you're doing already a joint exam, a rapid three, um, are the, uh, or some sort of an enthesitis measure such as the leads and the skin assessment such as a body surface area. And you, you'll, you'll know whether your patient is an MDA. And this just compares DAPSA with MDA. Again, you know, I think um, uh, just uh, as more as a reference in terms of uh, um, use and interpretation of data. And similarly, just at high level, uh, the ACR guidelines were published a number of years ago. I think they are probably due for uh, an update at some point. Um, but I will say that I, I think you know these are um, they're helpful. Um, uh, although, <clears throat> again, I think you know there are some uh, a number of caveats with regard to the way uh, these guidelines um, are are um, you know uh, are are derived. Um, and so, you know, a, a helpful resource. Um, I would argue, you know, at the same time, really, I think what trumps all of these is shared decision-making with the patient around their goals. And, you know, and, and again, that both domain-based approach and comorbidity assessment in picking the right patient for uh, the right treatment for the right patient. And so my last slide finally is, you know, how do we start to push the envelope even further than what we've talked about today? And hopefully over time, we'll be hearing more about personalized medicine approaches uh, in a given patient. We are particularly excited about combination therapy approaches and we'll have another session uh, here at IAS talking about some of that, um, uh, some of those uh, thoughts and uh, uh, around combination therapy. Um, uh, novel mechanisms of intervention, there still remains an interesting pipeline of drugs um, facing different mechanisms or nuances around known mechanisms. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, other deep questions like PSA prevention. Are there intervention points uh, throughout the course of disease that may prevent the development of psoriatic arthritis, for example? Um, should we be treating the subclinical inflammation that we see in upwards of 30 to 50% of our patients? And so with that, I thank you for your attention uh, and I will, uh, I will end my, uh, my portion of the talk. Okay, guys. Um, so just quick housekeeping. This activity that we just saw was supported on independent educational grants from Abby and Jansen. And now we do have Dr. Marola here to answer questions for us. Um, and I did get a couple throughout the talk. So maybe Dr. Marola will start with those and we'll see um, how we go. Okay. So the first question we have here. So for patients seen in the dermatology clinic that have skin disease, but also have mild emphysitis, what would be your first line treatment? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, I think um, uh, it's a little tricky. I, I, I'm starting to think a little bit more in terms of risk stratifying some of the patients that we're seeing in dermatology. And if you feel comfortable doing that yourself, I think that's wonderful. And if, you know, if it's with the help of a rheumatologist, by all means, but I think, um, yeah, it's worth starting with who are the folks that we think are going to have more aggressive disease or more progressive disease. Um, so if there are, and there are a few, you know, um, uh, uh, predictors of that. So for example, if we know that they have baseline erosions, baseline damage uh, on exam, then I certainly would think about uh, some of the drugs that we mentioned that include uh, inhibition of radiographic progression data such as the anti-TNFs, the IL-17s, as, uh, as we mentioned. Um, if we know that they have very elevated inflammatory markers, um, that's not a perfect predictor, but I would say that that in general clusters with folks who tend to have more aggressive or progressive disease. Uh, if we truly know that it's limited to anthesial disease and soft tissue disease, um, <clears throat> I actually think you know, all of our current agents that we use uh, in terms of you know, biologics and some of the oral small molecules are reasonable uh, as, uh, as you saw the data for uh, many of those with regards to uh, enthesitis. Um, so, you know, that's really across the breadth of anti-TNFs, IL-17s, IL-23 inhibitors, uh, and even, um, uh, you know, JAK inhibitors, if, if you happen to be using those for, um, you know, uh, uh, for the skin, which would be less likely probably in the psoriasis as well. But yeah, but that's it's a good question because I feel like, Mattel, those are the patients that we probably are more likely to see in the derm office, right? Not the person who comes with the big red hot swollen knee or, you know, really rip roaring polyarticular disease uh, so much as the soft tissue. So it's a, it's a really good question. Yeah. 
Thank you. Great. So we have um, another question here. Any suggestions on how to remember or keep track of all, all of the existing biologic agents um, as they're coming out and the new ones staying up to date? Yeah, that's an easy one. You have to join us for the IAS every year, right? Um, cheap plug. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, it, it's, it, is, it can be overwhelming, you know, and, and it, if you look at the number of biologics we have in 2021 across the breadth of psoriasis, cirrhosis, it, it's, it's pretty, it, it, you know, they're pretty numerous. Um, I think there's a couple of good resources. So one of the things to think about, um, well, there's one that's hopefully coming soon. Uh, there's uh, the AAD guidelines uh, committee um, is working through putting together some uh, an, an app and some uh, online content that are based on the AAD psoriasis um, guidelines document that came out uh, last year. Uh, so hopefully that will be a resource for folks that also has uh, you know is updated from time to time. We'll have links to um, you know to uh, individual medications and classes. So that that may be one helpful resource. I think many of our society. Websites uh, are also quite good uh, in terms of resources there, you know, whether it's um, Grappa, Pac-Man, IPC and others, you know, that offer a variety of resources on their websites um, and also programs throughout the year to keep people up to date. So I, I, I think those are probably some of the better um, resources at high level. Um, you know, I would, I, I would check into those periodically throughout the year for, for updates. And, and again, you know, forums like this, of course. Um, so we have a question here for axial disease. Does radiographic progression measure newborn new bone formation? Does does the spark measure that? So so no. So the spark and the um, the spark and the leads uh, uh, tools are are if that's what they're asking are are um, outcome measures for enthesitis. Um, so if you're looking at an outcome measure, I think that's uh, maybe what they're asking. If, if you're looking at an outcome measure. Uh, for enthesitis, um, you can look for data from the trials for the Leeds Enthesitis Index or Spark. I think one of the more meaningful endpoints is looking at um, Leeds uh, or Spark of zero, meaning complete resolution of enthesitis. Most typically, we look at about you know week 24, and then you know 52 for more you know uh, uh, persistent um, uh, persistence data. Uh, so I, I think um, I, I think that might be what you're getting at for axial disease, and I should say also the radiographic progression. Uh, data uh, that we talk about is inhibition of radiographic progression in uh, peripheral joints. Uh, and that's measured by, uh, you know, an expert uh, radiologist who looks at joint space narrowing as well as uh, joint erosion. Uh, and it does not reflect um, axial com uh, compartment of disease. So really the, the axial piece is measured best by um, uh, sacred iliac joint films. And then if those are negative from a diagnostic perspective, uh, sometimes thinking about moving to MRI, of the sacred iliac joints uh, for, for diagnosis. Uh, but um, ho hopefully that's hopefully that answers your question. Great, and then this question, which might be challenging, but always good to see what your perspective is. Someone's asking if you can um, help differentiate efficacy between ixekizumab and secukinumab as related to adalimumab. Well, I can do them <clears throat> individually, but not against each other because we don't we don't necessarily have anything uh, any data there per se. But um, but we do have head to head data both in the Spirit head to head trial for ixekizumab, as well as in the Exceed trial with um, secukinumab, each against adalimumab. Uh, and I think you know this. I don't know if this is coming maybe from a rheumatologist, uh, but but in either either case, um, <clears throat> you know both of those trials um, looked at. Um, uh, superiority to adalimumab as well as um, either primary or secondary endpoints of a composite looking at skin and joint disease. And if you look at the composite endpoints, you do see, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, I should say, um, at least with the uh, excusumab study, um, superiority to adalimumab um, with, you know, at the, at the uh, primary endpoint as well as at week 52 uh, with um, uh, the exceed trial. Um, they were numerically uh, better numbers with uh, secukinumab, but it was, did not meet statistical significance at their primary ACR20 endpoint, but it did uh, with the um, uh, composite endpoint, um, which I think is important for us to know. So, you know, when we think about how we tier these drugs, you know, with regard to each other, uh, we certainly have some data supporting the use of IL-17s, I would argue, as first-line agents uh, in the psoriasis or arthritis patient, for sure. 
Okay, great. Um, so I think with that, we are coming close on our time here. So um, thank you, Dr. Morola, for joining us and for answering all of those questions. It was a pleasure. And <laughs> and then for our audience, um, please do join us for the next Innovation Theater. We will be discussing early recognition and treatment for steroidic arthritis, and that will start at 1055. Um, so please do join us for that. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle.